Bienvenue, Ani. Welcome everyone to this special event in honor of Black History Month. I'm Rebecca Luce Kapler, Dean of the Faculty of Education at Queen's. I'm so pleased to be present for this session along with all of you. To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. Acknowledging history is important, not only for reconciliation with the Indigenous peoples of this land, but also for addressing the oppression of Black people in this country and making spaces to share the diverse stories and accomplishments of Black Canadians. To start our uh, interesting session today, I'd like to introduce you to one of our outstanding professors here at Queen's, Dr. Alana Butler from the Faculty of Education, who will introduce our special guest and lead us into this session. Thank you very much, um, D Dean Rebecca Luce Kapler for um, that introduction. And also uh, along with Rebecca, Becca Carnival for organizing this uh, amazing event today. So I wanna thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing our wonderful moderator. Alyssa Verden Vernon is in her fourth year of her BA in Gender Studies in the Concurrent Education Program. She's the founder and co-chair of Queen's Collage Collectives, a club she formed due to her belief in anti-oppressive education and valuing art as resistance. We are very um, excited to have um, Alyssa volunteer to be a moderator today. Um, now I have the um, privilege of introducing our speaker today. Dr. Terrell, Cheryl Thompson is an assistant professor at Ryerson University in the School of Creative Industries. She is also a member of the Yates School of Graduate Studies and the Graduate Program in Communication and Culture. She earned a PhD in Communication Studies from McGill University in 2015. Prior to joining Ryerson, she held a Shirk Banting postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto in the Centre for Theatre, Drama and Performance Studies and the University of Toronto, Mississauga and the Department of English and Drama. In 2020, she was appointed co-director of the Studio for Media Activism and Critical Thought. In addition to her academic work, she has published in the New York Times and is a frequent contributor to Spacing, Zoomer, The Conversation, and Horizons magazine. She is currently working on a Shirk Insight Development Grant funded project called Newspapers, Min, Min Story, and Black Performance in the Theater, mapping the spaces of nation building in Toronto from the 1870s to 1930s. Her first book, Beauty in a Box, Detangling the Roots of Canada's Black Beauty Culture was published by Wilfrid Laurier Press in 2019. Her current book, Uncle, Race, Nostalgia, and the Politics of Loyalty was published in February by Coach House Books. And that's um, the topic of today's talk. So welcome, Dr. Cheryl Thompson. Wow, thank you. Uh, you know, it's always, you just feel like from the days of being a grad student to where I am now, that that introduction is just getting longer <laughs> and, and longer. I got tired just reading that, Cheryl. I was like, <laughs> "You're, you're." I was just amazing. like, "When's she going to end?" But it's like, I'm like, "Yeah, I was." I and I had to cut your bio. Real, realize I I checked it. I had to cut it down. <laughs> it was so. I was like, "Wow!" But anyway, thank you for honoring us today. Yeah, no, this is a great. Uh, I'm I'm happy to be here, um, and I'm excited for the conversation. Turn this over to our wonderful moderator, Alyssa Vernon. 
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you all for having me. Um, and very nice to meet you, Dr. Cheryl Thompson. Um, so I will start off with the first question we have for you today. So in your book, Uncle, uh, you trace the historical roots of Uncle Tom from the Harriet Beecher Stowe's character to the current use of the term as a pejorative for Black people who are regarded as sellouts. Uh, what do you think was the reason for this change? Yeah, so, so first to, um, to implicate myself in the discussion, you know, as I'm sure many of you on the call, I've always known of Uncle Tom. Even before I read, I read Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin when I was like 25 and it took me a year because 19th century literature is very dense and that's a very dense book. But I'd always known of the term. And, and so at a certain point, um, you know, when you go into the archives and you're grappling with issues of race and, and nationhood and all those things, you, you come across certain things. So even in my work on, on Blackface, I have many um, archival records of Blackface Uncle Tom's Cabin performances. So even in there, it was coming up, right? So it just led me to say to myself, how come I was clearly not born in the 19th century, yet I know of this word, but the way I know of this word is not the way I feel it was intended in the novel, right? Even though in the contemporary, when people mention the word, they act as if the novel's use of the word is relevant today. When I was just intuiting that I don't think it's the same use. So what I wanted to do in that book is to go on a journey to figure out how is it that Uncle Tom from the novel is still here, but how as that name and the person and the, the, what it is today is not just a word used to describe a quote unquote sellout, but it's also a kind of racial epithet, right? So how did it morph into that? And, and why is it that people are not aware of that morphing? They keep going back to the novel. And so you ask the question of why, you know, is that term used to quote unquote denote a sellout? And I don't know if everyone really understands what that concept is. You know, the Uncle Tom of Uncle Tom's Cabin was really a loyal person, right? He's a, a figure based on the real life Reverend Josiah Henson, who was a fugitive enslaved African-American who came north to Canada, founded the Don Settlement in Dresden, Ontario, and then subsequently went, uh, wrote um, a biography about his life, corresponded with, with Harriet Beecher Stowe around the same time. So she loosely based the character of Uncle Tom's Cabin in the character of Uncle Tom in that novel on the, the real life. Josiah Henson, okay? So in that story is a story of someone who was an enslaved person who was just very loyal to their, their master. So loyal that they would, you know, be asked to move slave, enslaved people to different states and they would be so loyal that they would move them to the states and then they would come right back. They wouldn't think of freeing themselves from the system of, of their own enslavement. And so that's what Uncle Tom is. And then Uncle Tom also dies a martyr. You know, he dies this loyal Christian, God-fearing person who, who wouldn't harm anyone, and he takes those beats, right? Throughout the decades, the reason why Uncle Tom changes is because American society changes. And especially in the 1890s with the um, Plessy v. Ferguson is the groundbreaking Supreme Court case that legislatives, legislates Jim Crow segregation and creates basically two societies in America, legislated through law. And so that law, even though post the novel, yes, Uncle Tom had been circulating around and there were minstrel shows and, and, and even in advertising, it's when you have a legislated uh, segregation that, and at the same time, um, a dominant culture who is invested in kind of a black masculinity that's nice, that's pleasant, that is not confrontational, that is not aggressive. Uncle Tom as a caricature then becomes this thing which black men are measured against. And it's also the thing to kind of thwart any kind of black masculinity that would be aggressive, right? 
same way the black quote brute as they would have been called this this archetype of a hypersexed black male who's running after white women to 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 rape them that caricature also is created to also keep the black um masculinity in check. So you have these two polar opposites. And so what becomes more appealing is to try to assume an almost Uncle Tom um, persona. And so through the 19th century into the 20th century, you have actual jobs such as the railway porters, right? The Pullman porters, who I have mad respect for, trust me. And I've read all the books that have been written. But when you scrape it down, the job of the Pullman Porter was to essentially assume the role of an Uncle Tom in at their work. So this was kind of what we would call a servile Uncle Tom, there to serve and smile and always be happy. You know, those men who did that work, they were from a different cloth because imagine the things that they had to put up with <clears throat> and the things they had to take. Behind that smile was so much lived life. But then as we get into the 20th century, things change, you know, post-civil rights, you have a different sense of Black identity. And so you also have a different sense of Black people in general across North America entering different echelons of society, living in the suburbs, living amongst white families, um, attaining post-secondary degrees, going on PhDs, becoming Supreme Court judges in the case of Clarence Thomas. So now you have a whole generation of Black people who are no longer what you would consider to be an underclass. There are elements within Black communities of people who have quote unquote made it, who have who have transcended into, into actually having authority in the community and also in the country at large. Then this is where Uncle Tom changes again, because now you have this figure who is basically more interested in maintaining those same institutions that help them on the come up than bringing up their entire community. And so this concept of the sellout, that's exactly what it's denoting. It's denoting a person who has sold out their community for their own individual um, pursuit of wealth attainment and all the other things. And we can see how this still plays out right? Most recently, um, Daniel Cameron, the attorney general of, of the state of Kentucky, the minute he came out, and now we're, we're learning that he actually lied about so much with the grand jury related to Breonna Taylor, someone publicly called him an Uncle Tom and a sellout. And I thought that that's the perfect example, that now people can see what, what, that, what the meaning behind the Uncle Tom in the present, that there's actually real lives behind when you hurl that at someone, it's it's a very real thing. Thank you, that was a very like, you hit every mark with, with that <laughs> answer. Um, and personally that, the Uncle Tom stereotype, that kind of reminds me, um, especially like bringing that into now in the present day, like in rap culture, I think they, they use that a lot. And it makes me think of Jay-Z's song, The Story of OJ. Yes. Um, and yes. he talks about like how, um, like, what was it, the lyric? He said how there was like a difference between, um, he, he uses the N-word, but he says that um, there are field uh, people who worked in the field and people who worked in, um, yes. in the house in slavery. And he kind of used that Uncle Tom like servant, um, like sellout to kind of, um, contrast with the whole like I'm from the hood I'm from the streets I'm a field like right. Negro basically I mean I have a whole chapter in the book on OJ mm -hmm. um, where I talk about OJ I, I, I tried you know one of the things I tried to do in the book was and this was one of the things I actually struggled with at first um, was realizing that I'm not a biographer <laughs> okay so I, I wasn't because there's because I even have I talk about a lot of people that people know Clarence uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas Bill Cosby um, Sidney Portier I have a whole chapter on him I talk about Dr Martin Luther King but I'm not a biographer trying to tell you their life stories and and who they were I I had to be very careful when I was doing that writing and it, and it took it took a lot of revisions to make sure that I was emphasizing the way in which Uncle Tom has been attached to their public personas. 
and OJ is like the perfect example of a case of what not to do in life, you know, to basically ignore and separate yourself from your community to achieve your goals. And then when you get in trouble, suddenly you're the blackest person that we've ever seen. And you're like ready to raise a fist and, and do the marches. And it's like, well, wait a second, OJ, you know, you spent like 40 years pretty much acting as if you were part of the white culture. In the book, I actually label him a passing Uncle Tom, meaning he was trying to pass into white culture until he got implicated into the law through that case. And then the weird thing happened that, and I remember this because I lived through the OJ trial. The weirdest thing about it is that we started to see Christopher Darden, who was the on the, the prosecution as the Uncle Tom, because he seemed to be defending the state. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's a prosecutor. He was doing his job. <laughs> like we literally, the legal team, Johnny Cochran, questioned his racial loyalty every minute he could and basically saying, look at this man doing the work of the state and all this stuff. And so you can see it through that. And I talk about that in the book. Like that's kind of where I focus a lot of the emphasis to kind of retell in many ways, aspects of the trial and how it played out and, and through sourcing real life anecdotes from Christopher Darden, from OJ and just news coverage because, you know, back in the day, Oprah was all on this too. So like she had Oprah shows. And so I got in, I went into the vault to like, into like, you know, research to find those um, quotes from the Oprah show of what was actually said. And it was just really fascinating to see how um, in academic talk, you would say discursively, right? Uncle Tom, at the same time as being invoked in this moment, is also dividing Black community once again. You know, just dividing us about everything that we can't even see the, the issues clearly because we're still caught up on who's an Uncle Tom and who isn't. That we're, we're missing the fact that two people were slain to death. Like that kind of got lost in the conversation as we, as we focus so much on race and, and authenticity. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the next question is kind of a follow up to continue this conversation. So how do you feel about how the term Uncle Tom has been used to label Black people? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think it, the, and I even say this in the book, you know, what it does is that it creates this, um, it's like this thing that's outside of you, for which you're always being compared against. Right. And always being sure. And, 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 you know, in the book, I actually talk a lot about the, the black women stereotypes because you can't talk about uncle Tom without talking about Mammy and aunt Jemima. And I even talk about um, doll culture, topsy turvy dolls. Most people are, don't even remember them, but they used to exist throughout the 19th and, and into the 20th century. And so, you know, what happens is that you are now measured against something that is not actually real. <laughs> you know, and I think one of the things I do reference in the book, um, you know, there's a Sidney Portier movie, um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, right? Where he's invited to, he's dating a white woman and he's invited to their house. And this movie came out in 1968, <laughs> I think, or 1967. I think it was 67 and then 68, like just right at the height when there was a lot of stuff going on in America. And here you had on the big screen, this squeaky clean black man dating this white woman. And of course he's invited over and Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy are the parents, <laughs> right? So you have like Hollywood, like royalty as the parents. And the whole movie is like this sanitized, like trying to please white audiences with a narrative of integration. But look at who the, integrated person is they have to dress like they do they have to talk just like they do they have to have cultural capital just like they do that is inauthentic to the black experience and so that's the reason uncle tom keeps coming up because we're not realizing the things that we put on black men and women to do to make you comfortable because it really is about white comfortability that's why uncle tom is here so that when you get into the role of 
district attorney. You're going to remember that who put you here and you're going to do the things to service that person. You're not going to do the things to make fundamental change in the system that's going to uplift people who look like you. Suddenly you become this uber individual. And I will, you'll hear like, especially black conservatives, especially in the U S and there are some in Canada too. You'll hear what they say. I think for myself, what I'm only being critis criticized because I think for myself, I'm an individual. And it's like, yeah, you are an individual, but guess what? This means that you also get treated a certain way that is shared experience. So it's almost like a, a real, on a psychic level, a denial of shared experience. It would almost be like women who are here in this call, you just denying the fact that you're a woman <laughs> and you just keep saying, no, I'm a person. I'm not, a, I'm not a woman. I don't want to do, I don't want anything to do with women. And you would probably start to say, okay, that's a bit, right? And it's the same thing for people who want to identify as non-binary. Imagine if suddenly they were just like, no, I'm not non-binary. I'm a man. <laughs> like, it's just like, no, every single group, it doesn't matter what you are in this world. I believe this. This is my own theory that you stand as an individual, but you always stand as a collective too. It actually doesn't matter who you are. Even white men, you know, there are white men who might think I'm, I'm just John. Yes, John, but you are also part of a group of white men collective, right? The only difference is, is that you're never, you're never really asked in your life to see yourself as part of a collective. So you have a hyper sense of your individuality, whereas the quote unquote others must always see ourselves as part of a community. And I think that's where people who resist, it's because they don't want to be seen as part of a community. They just want to stand on their own. And it's just not the reality of being a human being on earth that you're going to stand on your own. For sure. I definitely agree with the, um, the whole, you're definitely living as a part of a collective, whether you know it or not. Um, and definitely it does have to do with like white culture and white supremacy and and how it like shapes white white folks especially to believe that they're they're individuals and they don't have anything like to do with a specific group but um and so that's kind of how they get away with having this really bad like culture of whiteness where where oppression is happening for people of color um and they are deemed like one black person, even if they're, they believe themselves to be an individual when they speak or when they have actions that they're doing, they are being labeled as a representative of their entire race and their entire like. That's right. Community. And I mean, I, I always think of it when, I think it was, I, I think it was the, the Las Vegas mass shooting mm -hmm. where that man had been staying at that, that hotel, that casino, mm -hmm. bringing in guns. <laughs> And then went up there in front of a concert and shot up his basically his own people, right? Because mm -hmm. I think it was a country concert. And then I think it was after that shooting, I, I believe it was CNN I was watching, and they showed a screen of all the mass shooters since Columbine. So we're going back to like 98 or whenever Columbine was. Mm -hmm. And it was a sea of white men. And I thought to myself, if this had been a screen of say, which they love to do because say the city of Chicago does have an issue with gang violence on the South side. Say if it was like, let's show all the, the, the quote unquote, gang members on the South side, that would have been the intro for a CNN special on the issues of crime in the <laughs> black community. <laughs> it would have been tagged to the black community. Mm -hmm. And yet here was a screen filled with every shooter and it was a white male and there was no tagging them to a community. And mm -hmm. I thought that is how in the visual culture, whiteness continues to be framed in an individual lens, whereas the others are always a collective. And so where it gets interesting with Uncle Tom is it's you almost see with the black figure, it, this deep psychic level desire to embody whiteness. Like that's actually what the sellout Uncle Tom is trying to say to you is that I want to be like my white colleague, Bill. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be like my black cousin, Jamal. Mm -hmm. I actually don't want that. I want to. And if you're never 
addressing that inner desire to actually literally pass into whiteness, then you're absolutely right. This is how structures of white supremacy just continue. They don't get challenged, even when you see black and other racialized people seemingly enter those structures, right? In the civil rights movement, when they were pushing for the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, the, the intention of those people was really that once we get policies in place, and then we have legislators who look like me, that there will be change. Mm -hmm. What we now know <laughs> is that it just doesn't work that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's much more complicated than that. For sure. That reminds me of the whole um, my model minority um, concept too. So it's not just like um, white people who do that. It's like brown people, it's yep. Asian people. They, um, and obviously, black people as well like they believe that if they're um kind of like tuning into whiteness so whether that's like speaking different acting different um rejecting your culture um they believe that that's going to get them further like closer to to that proximity of whiteness of um, course and, and a lot of that a lot of that is tied into rejecting your food your cultural mm -hmm. food, rejecting your cultural music, rejecting a certain speech pattern, right? Speaking, you know, my family's Caribbean and all the Caribbean people you know, we call it Queen's English. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it's Queen's English exclusively, like don't let any words slip and all of that. And I think you also don't, and this is going to be deep audience, <laughs> but you also don't realize how you're denying yourself full right of citizenship to exist. You're not existing as a full person. Mm -hmm. Everybody who does that, they're actually half a person and they're not aware of it. And I think for me, that's, that's where it gets complicated because now you have this half person because they are black or racialized and they're in a position of authority. The white people that they work with will, will task them with writing policies that impact our communities mm -hmm. and they're coexisting in this world as half of me. <laughs> and then they're writing policies for me. Yeah. Of course, those policies aren't working and we're just seeing, we're, see, we're seeing it, right? It's, it's not like I'm saying anything that you can't see or haven't seen, mm -hmm. especially being in education. Hello. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm, for sure. All right. Um, I think we'll move on to the next question. Um, and perhaps I saw that someone put up their hands. Um, I can't exactly see the participants. So perhaps we can take questions at the end if there's time. Um, yes. from other oh, yeah. we'll, we'll leave time for questions. For sure. Okay, amazing. All right, so the next question is, uh, in your earlier book, you discussed Canada's black hair culture. Uh, mm -hmm. So what are the barriers for black folks to become owners and suppliers of those kind of black hair products? Yes, I mean, I was just having a conversation with someone about this just yesterday. And what I said is, just like the conversation of Uncle Tom is a structural one, like it really is about systems and structures, right? The barrier for those wanting to open up a business is also structural. I mean, think about how I've heard anecdotally the stories of how difficult it is for Black business owners who are young entrepreneurs to get a loan, to get a line of credit. If you're trying to start a business solely on cash flow, meaning customers coming in, buying product or service, you, you're actually, it's not sustainable. Every business needs equity in the business. They need something. They need capital, whether it's a loan, whether it's a line of credit, whether it's sponsorship. And oftentimes, um, you know, new black businesses getting started, they don't have those opportunities. And <clears throat> hair care and barbering has not typically been respected on the same level, I think, as say the hair salon and or the hair stylist, <laughs> if you understand how I've changed my, my, my wording there just not respected on the same level. So you tell people, you, you know, someone to say, oh, I'm a barber. They act like that's, a, like, like that's a menial job. No, that person owns a business. They have loyal clientele. They are specialized in their field. And I've always said barbering in Canada, that is one topic. Can someone write that book, please? 
if you're in this right now, like we need to hear those stories. A lot of our barbers who've been doing this for 50 years are dying out because they're getting old. We're aging out of those stories to know how they actually survived. Like, how is it that you kept a barbershop open for 50 years? And in the city of Toronto, there's tons of examples like that. And when I was doing, when I was writing Beauty in a Box, I remember I found an ad from the Dawn of Tomorrow, which is a London, Ontario based um, newspaper that was started by an African American who had moved to London in the 19th century. Um, there was an ad I found from like 1925 or six. And the ad says, been in business 50 years. And it was a black barber. So that means that business would have been opened in like the 1870s. We never get to hear that story. That story is now gone, right? So the thing about, I believe that change happens. And I know this from all my years studying African-American history and culture and also living in America. I lived in America in the nineties for a couple of years. Is that the thing we don't recognize about the African-American experience is that it has been brought into being through the stories that they've told about themselves. And it was brought into being starting in the 1920s most prominently. It did not happen organically. There's always this sense when Black Canadians look South, we think, oh, just organically, look at America. No, you had specific individuals at specific times who said, we need to tell this story. And especially as it relates to Black beauty culture, that actually did not happen until the early 2000s. It was the late 90s, early 2000s, where you had a string of books coming out written by Black women telling the Black hair story. It didn't, it, so before then, it did not exist. There was no book, there was absolutely nothing. And so because you had a string of books being written in like the late 90s and the 2000s, you know, suddenly now there's in the collective public consciousness, there's an awareness of Black beauty culture. It's not that it didn't exist before then, of course it did. Madam C.J. Walker, we can go back, right? Even in the, in the 1970s, you have Johnson Products, tons of companies, but they were not writing their stories into being. And so how does that relate to the, to the entrepreneur? It means that when you go into the bank and you're, you're a barber and you're trying to get a loan, that person trying to assess your application is like barbering? Is that, they might even ask you, is that sustainable as a business? <laughs> They might not even know. And, then, and so you're being questioned now about basically the f barbering, for example, is the first occupation for black men, I would say, in the quote unquote Americas. Because even during slavery, enslaved black men were often tasked with cutting their master's hair. So they had to learn how to do that. And so we have in our culture a profound lack of respect for our histories of labor. And I think that's what undercuts a lot of this because a lot of the things that black people wanna get into business and do, they, we've been doing for centuries, right? It's not really new. Cause even you think about black designers, it's like, you don't think if we go back to the enslavement days that there wasn't an enslaved person who was tasked with, how does, how does my suit look, <laughs> right? Can you tailor this? tailoring, especially in the Caribbean community, is also one of our historical um, occupations. My dad is a tailor and he used to do that on the side as he worked at, at CP Rail. And so a lot of Black Caribbean men in particular have those skills. Now, say you go into a bank and say you want to get a loan or a line of credit to open a tailor shop. They're going to question you. They're going to say, did you go to fashion school? <laughs> do you have an MBA? They're going to ask you all this, these questions about your training. Meanwhile, you have cultural training that has prepared you and you have generational knowledge that has prepared you for this occupation, but it's just not validated. So I think those for me are the structural ways in which um, anti-Black racism actually gets played out, but it's, it, it, it's something that it's very difficult to talk about or like pinpoint if you were the person right? Going in for that loan. Like, how would you have that conversation? You would just say, yeah, I got denied again. <laughs> I guess I'm just going to have to do it on my own kind of thing. And like I said, if you do it on your own, it's not sustainable. That's why a lot of our businesses don't tend to last, you know, five, five years maybe. And then you see it shutting down. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have one more question and then we can take the audience questions. So uh, what advice do you have for educators in schools or universities looking to bring black literature and history into their classrooms? Yes, and I think there's, this is a multi-layered response. The first response is yes, what took you so long? <laughs> We've been here and there's lots of materials for you to work with for at least 50 years. So I don't know what you were waiting on. That's the first thing, right? The second thing is to understand that, and I say this, and I know a lot of people have been saying this too, is Black history is Canadian history. So I don't know why we have to separate the two. You know, we love Viola Desmond now because she's on the money and all that stuff. Like Viola Desmond wouldn't have exist if there hadn't been a system of anti-Black racism and Jim Crow in Nova Scotia in the first place. So you can't unmesh the two, they are deeply meshed. And so what it means is if I, for example, am a white, if I were a white educator, it means that in order for me to actually bring those readings into my, into my syllabus, I would have to grapple with my own personal connection to, to Black community, to race, to anti-Black racism. The truth is, and I think that's why you don't see a lot of it on people's syllab syllabi because they, they haven't done that personal work. Because if you haven't done that personal work, then you can't see the connection. And I always think of a scholar by the name of Jennifer Nelson. Jennifer Nelson is, is out um, in the East Coast and she wrote a book called Raising Africville. And it was about Africville, which is the historically um, African Nova Scotian community that was raised in the 1960s, just like so many across the country, Hogan's Alley in Vancouver, even here in the city of Toronto, a lot of our black communities that had been here for centuries, a lot of white Canadians don't realize they were demolished and removed and erased in the 1960s under the guise of urban renewal. So that's partly why a lot of black histories are not remembered because they were liter literally flattened, <laughs> like literally, right? But Jennifer Nelson is not, is not black. She's a white Haligonian who had to address the fact of her whiteness in relation to this black community. And she wrote a book and I, when I used to teach black studies at the University of Toronto, I, I always included that chapter because it was her reflecting on her own life, her own connection to that community and, and her own ways in which she could see the way the community was, was subjugated and all the stuff that happened. Honestly, that is the only way you can bring that work into your classroom and it feels authentic to you. You have to self-reflect. And I know as someone born and raised in Canada, shout out Scarborough. I am one of Scarborough's finest, I'd like to think. Um, me and The weekend, <laughs> and so many others. Catherine Hernandez, I can go through the list, man. We Scarborough is just like killing it lately. But yes, this, yeah. Cheryl, yeah. I have to interrupt Elena. I'm from Scarborough, so. <laughs> what, you see to, what I'm saying? We, our ombudsperson is actually from Scarborough too. So we're <laughs> repping here at Queen. We just are so repping. You know. Big time. Hard you know, for Scarborough. I'm telling you, when I was a kid, I was like, I wanted to be mayor of the city of Scarborough. Now that dream is gone because amalgamation. But, you know, one day, maybe we could have a symbolic ceremony. <laughs> but the point is, is that I grew up in Scarborough at a time. And Atlanta, you probably grew up in Scarborough at the same time where Scarborough was very white. Okay. It was not this like multicultural haven that we like to think it is today. And it has this, like, people always want to refer to Scarborough, like it's Brooklyn, like you have this, like, all this black culture. Yeah. We, cause the families like my family moved there in the seventies and in the eighties and nineties. And when we moved there, yeah, the clan was at the end of the street. And I'm not talking about, we thought like they were just racist. No, they were card carrying members of the KKK who lived at the end of the street. And I remember vividly every time we had to walk by their house to get to school, that was like the only way. Uh, funny enough, it actually wasn't the only way. It was just the fastest way. And we were just like, we're not, I remember my, my, my parents like, we are not letting these white people take us five minutes longer <laughs> for you to get to school. <laughs> so you're going to have to deal with them because you're going direct. And I think what great parenting. They basically in that moment said, don't change who you are because this outside person doesn't like you. 
this is the fastest way to go into school, you're going this way to school. But they would have dermamit, um, their dogs, domamit pinchers or whatever they're called, they would sick their dogs on us. So we were running to school in the early 80s being chased by dogs. And here we are in 2021, and those same people are probably like, oh, we have so much to learn about anti-Black racism. I, I have so many books to buy. You actually don't have any books to buy. You actually don't have anything to learn. You have to start to self-reflect on your own life. Because if I have experienced such terror and such violence as a small child, you were the perpetrator of that violence. Why don't you remember that? Like to me, one of the ways to heal is for the white amnesia around anti-Blackness to just be lifted so that we can all have a shared conversation about my trauma and violence and your acts of violence through ignorance. So you might have changed and grown and we can give you that, but you have to acknowledge, I wasn't chasing myself to school. <laughs> And I wasn't calling myself the N word while I chased myself to school. That were, those were white Canadians doing that to me and my sister. So we just have a, a knowledge gap around these experiences. And for me, until you as an educator acknowledge that in your own life, don't put bell hooks on your syllabus, please. Because you're not even going to understand what she's really even saying. It's just, it's just, don't put me on your syllabus either because you won't understand what I'm saying. You'll misinterpret it and you'll actually do a disservice to your class because then you're teaching critical race in, in ways that are actually wrong, right? Because you won't see, you won't understand the voice, you won't get the perspective. So it's, it's a catch 22 with just thinking that everybody needs to put critical race readings on their syllabus, not unless you understand what, where they're coming from. I definitely agree. And it makes me um, think about how, especially in terms of like class and school and integrating this kind of black history into your classroom before you would definitely have to do unlearning before you're learning a whole bunch of stuff that you have no idea like what it's about. Because how, again, like, as you're saying, how are you supposed to make room for this knowledge when you are already holding these beliefs um, that you definitely need to unlearn to make room for the new knowledge that you're going to learn. That's right. And, you know, you can't unlearn what you don't even know that you have to learn in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like you have to acknowledge that maybe you don't know. You know, I think to myself, and I'm sure Elena, you know, I don't want to speak for you, but obviously I see Scarborough, Black woman, probably around the same age. You know where I'm coming from. It's like, you know, no, when I was a little kid, okay, I never could have imagined, and this is actually gonna make me a bit emotional saying this, but I never could imagine I'm doing what I'm doing, mm -hmm. never. I never could have imagined even getting a PhD I, because that was not my experience. Everybody that taught me was white. Mm -hmm. And anytime I read a book, it was from a white person. And so now here I am in these walls, in sitting with my colleagues who are also, also white. And I think to myself, do they know that journey? Are they even astutely attuned to the fact that me in their presence is in my head as a child, almost an impossibility that was made possible? Like, do they even get that as we sit and we talk about things and we're colleagues and everything is great? And it, and it doesn't mean, you know, you walk around in awe and all that. It just means recognize that my presence means that I have now made something possible for those behind me that in my childhood was impossible, mm -hmm. <laughs> like completely impossible. And I'm not 70, you know, I'm not a, an old person by in the scale of age. I'm a relatively young person. And I'm telling you in my lifetime, it was not possible. And I think in Canada, we don't have those conversations enough. We just take diversity as, oh, great, we have diversity now. But no, 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 no. You don't seem to understand that even in my high school years, and I grew up in the 90s, still, mm -hmm. all my teachers were white. And I had one Black teacher who was horrible. <laughs> so that did not help, <laughs> okay? Like, right, if you have that one Black teacher and you have all this hope and dream and then they crush your spirit, almost worse than your white teachers do, that can also stay in your psyche. Because now you're like, man, I can't trust anyone in this. And so I think 
for me, you know, I've been rambling now that I can't even remember your question anymore. <laughs> but, but I just want to end on that tip, maybe just to say that, you know, having even this conversation, all the conversations that I've been having over the last little while, I just, I do pinch myself because I could never have even have imagined it when I started at McGill University in 2009 to do my PhD. Again, I looked around at my peer group and it was a sea of white students. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go on a ride. <laughs> this is going to be an adventure because that was who my peers were. And I almost felt like, and I'll just end here. I felt like that scene um, in A Time to Kill, um, the movie with Matthew McConaughey and um, uh, I can't even remember his Samuel name. Jackson. Samuel L. When, <laughs> the, you know, the whole story with the daughter. And then that film was actually being set in the 90s. Like it was set in its time, right? But even in that film, they're like, okay, this trial is gonna be held with a jury of your peers <laughs> and they end. And even at that time, it was all white people, <laughs> right? And you're thinking, okay, <laughs> like that's the system. And so for me, I think we're still there, right? And so there's a, there's a long way to go, but, but um, you know, the work that I'm doing is not to, it's not, I don't do guilt work. I do enlightenment work. And, and as you know, the journey of enlightenment is really up to the individual. You can't force anyone into it. Thank you so much. That was very, very good. Um, I'm very happy I was able to have this discussion with you and this opportunity to speak because this was very, very good. Um, and I'm pinching myself too, because uh, I didn't too. think I that I would be having these conversations either. <laughs> Oh, exactly right because because you never you never have space to have them like there's no space given and so you know I love when when sometimes I'm in certain situations and I don't say anything you know I'm very silent and then someone will, <laughs> someone white invariably will say Cheryl what are you thinking and you, as a black person we have a you know double consciousness is real so we have a double speak in our head like do you really want to hear what I'm thinking <laughs> Or do you want to hear something that's just going to affirm what you're thinking? Yeah. Like I always pause for a second and then I ask myself that question. Do I tell them the truth or do I just, and I realize sometimes I do speak the truth and sometimes I realize pick your spots, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't free everyone. If you ever, if you saw the film Harriet, I, I think that film did an accurate portrayal of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was like, <laughs> certain people, she's like, I'm going to leave that one <laughs> because they're not ready to be free. So I need to go and seek the people who want to seek their emancipation. If you want to stay here and live this life, I have to leave you. And, and, and that means she, she picked her spots and we all have to do that. You can't fight every battle. Okay, um, Alyssa, thank you so much for your awesome moderating. I think at this point we have 10 minutes. Um, I would invite the audience to post your questions for Dr. Thompson, or you can raise your hand and unmute yourself. I guess we'll give them give you both options. Yes, okay, so we have a hand up. All right, go to go ahead. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself, Sush, or just yeah, you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you, Sush. Yeah, yeah thank. That was a, that was obvious. Thanks for doing this. Um, so I work for a school board, and and might go back to the your Uncle Tom conversation, mm -hmm. but we're addressing sort of the. The N word in our schools and in the, in, the, in the playgrounds and you know all different types of contexts, and you know it seems very straightforward in terms of uh, and we have a predominantly predominantly white schools, predominantly white staff, um, and so you know with white students and and so on it seems pretty straightforward and and so on, uh, but one of the struggles we're having is uh, with you know having it when it's from a black student. Um, you know, talking about or using it with each other or whatever. Is there a difference on how that should be handled? Um, understanding kind of the complications around, uh, you know, the reclamation of that word and so on um, as a blanket policy for all kids, 
regardless of background, a good idea, or is that is it more nuanced than that, depending on the connection the student has to to the cultural piece in that word? Um, I, I hope that doesn't sound like an ignorant question. Just, no, it is no, a no, truthful no, no, no. thing. <laughs> We're yeah, really struggling no. with that piece. <laughs> no, absolutely. In fact, um, I am on a podcast. Um, the Conversation has a podcast that it just launched today, actually called uh, Don't Call Me Resilient. And the very first episode starring myself is about that exact <laughs> same question. <laughs> so you might want to tune into that podcast because I address it. But what I will say to you is here's why, you know, the N-word is a complicated conversation because you have in-group use of that word. Like you noted that there are Black students who use that word to to talk to each other. And then you have the longstanding history of that word as being a violent, traumatic um, word of anti-Blackness that's steeped in the um, in white supremacy and the use of that word to subjugate the Black subject, like that Black person and body. That's always been... So, but here's where it gets tricky. And so I think for me, I always say, and, and, and I've heard a lot of other African-American scholars say this to you, is that while we make those justifications, like what I just did, I said, oh, there's in-group and then there's out-group and this, if we just forget all that and we look at it from a linguistic point of view, the word is a violent word. The word mm -hmm. is steeped in histories of trauma and of deprivation. And so right. even the black person who refers to homie in that way, N word, this and that, what you'll find is if you scrape the surface, there's some things going on with that person that we might not consider to be the most uplifting and, and um, fully um, um, sort of in their wholeness as a person. And so right. what I always like to do is, especially when you're dealing with young people, is just say, hey, you know, have you thought about that word? And is there another way that you can refer to your friend <laughs> that might be a right. little bit more honoring of who they are as a person? Because if you really honor someone as a person, just on, right, you wouldn't, for example, um, if, you, if you honor a person on a deep level, you wouldn't go up to them and call them the B word. Right. And say, hi, it's so good to meet you, B. <laughs> You just wouldn't do that. And I think in my own colloquialism, when I'm hanging out with friends and I'm chilling and I, and I even hurl, for example, the B word, it's often at something really either dumb. So I'm using that word in a negative way. And I am aware that I'm using it in a negative way. It's very rare that I use it in an uplifting way. And I think what has happened in our culture is that we've gotten away from understanding the meaning of words. We just, we just don't talk about words that much. Like we talk about actions and what you did to someone, but we don't always break it down of what you're saying to someone. And I think, I think an, an education, I think it would be a good time to just have conversations about, you know, how does that word make you feel? You know, maybe people haven't even thought about how it makes them feel uh, and, 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 and getting at that, right? And then overlaying that with discussions of the fact that the word was rooted in the enslavement of black people. And then yes, it's been reclaimed through hip hop culture. But if you notice a lot of the hip hop artists who popularize that word, they don't even use it anymore. Right. And, and now they show up in quote unquote, mainstream films, speaking <laughs> the Queens English. I'm referring to a lot of those nineties rappers, right? They yeah. speak the Queens English now. <laughs> so I just think we need to put things into context and, and also remember that you always want to, for me, you always want to be putting out something that uplifts other people. And I think mm. there's no better place than school to get kids to really understand that, that your words can, can uplift, but they can also harm. That's awesome. Thank you very much. You're That's welcome. very helpful. All right. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Okay. So we do have some questions in the chat here. Um, I'm not sure if Alyssa can see them, so I'll just read it. Uh, and I'll try to be more succinct with my answer so we can get it through all of them. <laughs> Our next question is from Dr. Anita Jack Davies. I don't know, Anita, do you want to? Yes, Anita. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, there we go. Yes, yes, yes. 
Hi there. Hi, Dr. Thompson. How are you? Hi, I'm good. It's good, good to, hear to from see you. you. Thank yeah. you for your amazing talk today. I just wanted to ask about um, how do we deal with faculty who may say that they have a right to use the N-word in the name of academic freedom? I know it's a really big question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, and I, I, I always say, whenever I hear that, I'm like, can we have a discussion about freedom? Again, words, let's talk about freedom, shall we? <laughs> and then I would, you know, what does it mean to be free? And I think often white people have never really asked themselves that question. What does freedom look like to you? And then let me tell you what freedom looks like to me. Freedom for me, at least in the context of education, I always try to bring it back to something personal and, and get personal and, and get people to understand that black racialized, even LGBTQ2 plus people, people, even people with disabilities, we've never really been free in educational institutions. Like I could never just say exactly what I want to say. And I think often there isn't an awareness that that's that this concept of freedom is actually never been democratized. <laughs> like some people are more free than others. And often if you're white and male in academia, you're the freest of them all. You've always felt like you could just say whatever you wanted to say. Believe me, I remember when I was a student, I was in the States at the time. And I remember being in a class where a student actually, it was, I can't remember the class now, but I think it was about uh, international history of some kind. He raised his hand and he literally said, knowing well that I was from Canada, but I was also of Caribbean background. He literally raised his hand and said, the only purpose for the Caribbean is for American and Western interests to exploit the land and the people. That's the only reason that that region exists. <laughs> and the, the professor was like, okay. And then after class, they pulled me aside and apologized on their behalf, which I thought was actually passive aggressive. You should have addressed that student in the classroom. So my point is the only way to address these conversations about academic freedom is to talk about the language. What is freedom and what does it mean to be an academic? What do you see your role, right? Whenever we have those conversations, I think it's better for the black body to not answer, but to start asking questions of the person who is defending those two for me, very separate concepts, right? There's academia and then there's freedom. <laughs> I actually don't think, I, I, that's why I hate some of that languaging because I, I just think it's confusing that they don't really know what that means. The minute you decide to join an institution, you're actually not free. There are rules and regulations. <laughs> you are kind of restricted, right? So maybe we just need to be clear on what does it mean to be free in an academic space. And I don't feel like in a lot of institutions we ever really have that conversation. Instead, what they're actually telling you about, they're having a conversation about their rights. They're not really having a conversation about freedom, which I think is a different, uh, different conversation. Um, okay, so thank you. We have time for, I think, one question. Uh, Andrea Blackwood had, uh, has their hand up. Andrew, do you want to just unmute yourself? Yeah, just recently I had an experience that, you know, I have to, I have to still pinch myself to, mm -hmm. to realize it happened to me. Somebody who's been worked at the bank, had worked for the same bank for, but at the, at the head office level and walked into this bank that I had already had a business account, a legal practice account there. And just went in um, just about close to the ending of uh, 2020, 2020, sometime in December to open up. I already have a business account and I wanted to open up, a, take my business to corporation this year. So I got my certificate of authorization from Law Society and I brought that in and everything. And I was still being questioned so much. I was interrogated that I had to get the manager in, the gentleman questioned me and he tried to tie my credit to my and said, my credit is good, I have nothing derogatory. So why do you want to go to cooperation? I said, why am I explaining that to you? Law, Law Society already gave me authorization. Why are you giving me the third degree here? He did not open the account that day. He said, we will look at it further. And what do you do? I said, I'm a public record. Just Google my name. I will come up. I'm a public record. I don't believe I should be here defending myself just mm -hmm. to open a business account. So I left and I went outside. I called CIBC head office and I reported it. And it's after I reported, I let them know that I worked for CIBC in the past for years. 
and of my experience and they call back the branch. Uh, the gentleman did apologize to me and they told me I could go back and open my account, but I didn't, I didn't do that. I moved it to BMO because I could not believe that I have an account, a business account at this branch, but I didn't understand why he was questioning, why are you going to a corporation? So what do you do? What kind of legal? What? I said, I don't need to explain that to you. I'm public record, I'm a paralegal. And I'm also doing my law degree, but why are you questioning me this way? Do you question everyone this way? I'm already established with your bank. And then I didn't want to let him know that I worked for CIBC, but I was so disappointed. And I said, if I can't advocate for myself here today, I can't advocate for anyone else. But what you're doing is a disservice to your representation of CIBC. And they did apologize to me, but I did not go ahead and open the account. <clears throat> well, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that, that story just affirms what I was saying about how difficult it is for young, young, old, doesn't even matter, <clears throat> for Black people who want to be entrepreneurs or open a business, how there's just a lot of red, red lining almost, right, going on behind closed doors that unless you address it, it just keeps going on day after day. And I think the main thing, though, is to, uh, which you did, is to, I always say, you know, a no is just guiding you into another direction, right? It's like a no is not, you didn't get it. It's like, just go somewhere else. And, and often if you do that, you might find success somewhere else. And so unfortunately though, it's sad to hear that these things are still happening. Even when you have a record of like professionalism and you have, you know, you have the, the CV to back that there's still, Hey man, it still happens to me when people, when I tell people, yeah, I'm a professor, professor of what? <laughs> As if I have to tell you the discipline for you to really believe me, then I'll just say, you know what, at a university, like, I don't need to get into the details. But yeah, so that second guessing and the questioning is definitely something that we still have to deal with. Um, but keep your dignity and pride in that, in that moment. And Absolutely. It's, it seems like you did that. So kudos. Absolutely, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Kudos to you. Okay, so um, thank you, Andrea, for that question. Um, I'm just looking at the time, and as it always happens, I think we could go on for a few hours. There would be enough conversation, Dr. Tom. I mean, if there's one burning question left, like I could take one more. Okay, um, like, please. Yes, we could. There are actually some really good comments in the chat too, um, but I think Mir, there was a hand up. There is a hand up. Someone named Mir. Oh yes, yes, yes. This is one of my students, yes. Oh, hello. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, thank you for having me, having us all. My mm -hmm. question is, um, but is it appropriate for a white teacher to tell Black students not to use the N-word, especially given racial and uh, age-related power dynamics? Um, and specifically, this isn't um, like um, disputing the the like what the word means and how yeah. it is weaponized. Um, this is just like specifically asking like, um, for example, a white teacher asking black students not to swear period versus a white teacher telling black students specifically not to use the N word. No, no, no. So, so let me be clear. I don't believe teachers should ever tell students what to do. <laughs> And that's not what I'm saying. That's, that's why I would, that's why I laugh sometimes when I'm a professor because Mir, you should know better. I never tell you what to do. I just give you the tools to know what it is that you're doing and then you decide. So for me, teachers shouldn't be saying, no, you don't say that and don't use that word. It means this. Absolutely not. Instead, ask, why do you ask and listen? Why do you use that word? Have, engage, conversate, hear the point of view. Right. And then once you hear the point of view, if you'd like to offer another, I, that's why I love Iyana Van Zandt, because she doesn't tell nobody what to do. She says to them, have you considered this way of speaking? Have you considered it? It doesn't mean you have to listen. It doesn't mean you have to do what they're saying. It's just pointing out that there is another way to refer to your friend. Have you thought about that way? And then leaving it up to you. Like I said, consciousness is not a journey. Or it's not something that can be instilled in you. It's something you have to seek out. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you want to raise your consciousness and connect and engage with people on a different level, nobody can come and tell you to do that. Nobody can force you. In. And I don't believe in telling people not to do something as being the way, because you know, if somebody tells you not to do something, you're probably going to be like, I want to go and do that now. <laughs> 
<laughs> because there's something that they're hiding. There's going to probably some good things behind that, right? So it's not really about that. It is just considering another way of interacting. That's how I feel okay. about it. Because I think often as young Black people coming up, because I was young once too, we are often not aware of our own internalized um, enslavement that has nothing to do with the white other, that we are actually doing it to ourselves. We're just not aware. Mm -hmm. It took me many years to aware to be aware that a lot of the things that I thought was coming externally was actually things that I was doing to myself. So then I had to go on a quest and a journey to unlearn too and to undo mm -hmm. and to kind of see myself differently. Because I, when I was a young person, I really was absorbing a lot of what is really white supremacist thinking mm. about who I am and how I should show up in the world, right? So, you know, when, again, I don't mean to quote all these like senior women, but I love them so much. Maya Angelou did say, when you know better, you do better. She did say that. <laughs> and it's just a truism that is still true today. Thank you for clarifying and explaining. You're welcome. That's such a nice note to end on, Maya Angelou. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, wow. This was just amazing. Sorry um, to interrupt, Alana. Um, oh, yes. Can I perhaps just say one thing? Oh, this sure. Go ahead. Um, so this was making me think of an experience that happened to me in high school, which isn't too long ago. Um, so... I unfortunately was called the N-word by a student, a white student. And when this was brought to administration, um, the first thing that the principal asked me was, did he say the N-word with an A or an ER? <laughs> so if we're talking about policing the N-word, like a lot of these questions were, yes, I, so I had to pinch myself a lot to be like, that happened. <laughs> um, and, and you know what, the, the only thing I'll say, and I say this on the podcast, why, in the world would educators mm. compare themselves to entertainers? Yeah. Explain that to me. Like, are you gonna be in the classroom like, well, Nicki Minaj said, <laughs> is that who we're to cite? Should I cite mm -hmm. Nicki Minaj in my paper? Like, it doesn't make any sense. You're mm -hmm. an educator. The standard for your <laughs> language has to be higher than a pop star, mm -hmm. a rapper and a comedian. They serve a purpose, but they don't serve the purpose of education. Exactly. So that to me is very scary that they would even have that in their thought. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I, in terms of the questions about like policing the N-word and stuff, I would just say that's what not to do um, 100% is to like put your own personal opinion on, well, it, it couldn't have been that bad if it was said with an A because it's really bad if it's an ER. Oh. And the, the punishment that was doled out was based on which word he used. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, That's unreal. So, yeah. And, and like I said, that was probably just a few years ago. We're not talking about 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was five years ago. Yeah. Four years ago. Wow. 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 Yeah. I yeah. guess that person has a lot of reading to do. Yes. <laughs> my favorite line of 2020 is I have so much to read. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, I'm not complaining as an author. Please buy my book. Thank you so much. I hope, yes. <laughs> I hope it registers. But the reading is not the first act. The reading is actually probably act three or four. The first act is about reflecting on your own life and your own behavior. Mm. Always. Excellent. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Alyssa, for that, too. Just reminding us of how current uh, our discussion is. Um, <laughs> So I wanted to, I guess at the time, we're, we're up, we're out of time now. So yeah, I just want to thank, um, before I thank you, Dr. Thompson, which I have so much to say, I have so many questions actually, but I'm just going <laughs> to, we're just going to have to do something. Um, yeah, Zoom <laughs> or something. Yeah, um, that's part two. But, <laughs> um, I just want to thank Becca Carnival uh, for putting, for organizing this uh, for the, from a long time. She organized this and thank you so much, Becca, for doing this. Um, I would like to thank our Dean, uh, Rebecca Luce Kapler, and the Faculty of Education for hosting this, as well as our um, fabulous, just wonderful, this is the future, our concurrent education student, Alyssa Vernon, um, for moderating this. You did a sensational job. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Thompson, for such an entertaining and fascinating talk. It was so engaging. I had so many questions, and I think you really helped me think about how I, I see the term Uncle Tom in many ways. And you had 
um, a nuanced discussion, which I think is lacking today yes. uh, about all these issues. And I think we, I really took that away and appreciated it. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm, thank goodness, there was a recording of this. Um, because you had <laughs> yeah. a lot of wisdom that you shared with the group. So I want to thank you for that today. So um, thank you so much for honoring us with your presence, Dr. Thompson. And I hope this month isn't crazy for you. <laughs> you probably have talk after talk after talk, but um, you, you- Don't have remind me of my calendar, please. Yeah, please. I'm, I I'm in the moment. I don't want to see your, your calendar this month. Yeah, I'm in thank the moment. You. But we're glad we got in early. You notice yes. we're early. We're, we're like February 3rd. So you've got like another 20, 20 something days. So thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and time. Um, Alyssa, thank you uh, as well for your amazing work. And thanks everyone who attended on the call and for your incredible questions. Really good question in the chat. Uh, we will save them. So if there are any other ones that uh, Dr. Thompson didn't get to, we can make sure we get that answer to you. But so thank you everybody.